Have you ever looked at a Yu-Gi-Oh card and thought, how on earth do you play that? Well, my friend, gather round this virtual fire and I'll introduce you to Yu-Gi-Oh's sandbox mode. A combination of 10 cards that give a player the freedom to move cards from any location on the game board to another without cost. Firstly, you need Gale Dogra. With Dogra, you can pay 3,000 life points to put any card from your extra deck to the graveyard. Obviously, paying 3,000 life points is steep, but there is a way around it. With the equip spell Telekinetic Charging Cell, a psychic type monster is prevented from paying a life point cost to activate its effect. The only snag is that Gale Dogra is an insect, which is why you'll need Reprodocus to convert this Titan of the invertebrate world to a psychic. Now you can ditch cards from your extra deck for free as many times as you want. So who do you want to ditch? Well there's three cards in particular to get this combo running. The first is Herald of Arclight. When this is sent to the graveyard, you can add a ritual monster or spell card from the deck to your hand. The second, and perhaps most crucial, is Psy Framelord Omega. This card can return itself back to the extra deck from the graveyard by putting another card from the graveyard to its deck. This allows you to repeat the search effect of Herald of Arclight. Now in this combo, you're going to be wanting to add Advanced Ritual Art, which lets you Ritual Summon by tributing a monster in the deck. You'll also want to be adding Megalith Och, a Ritual Monster that lets you draw a card and then discard a card from your hand to the graveyard. A second Ritual Monster can be used to facilitate this discard effect. The final card of the three is Elder Entity Untess. When she's sent to the graveyard, you can destroy a card on the field. Between these cards, you can drive a cycle of movement between the hand, field, graveyard, and deck. This is achieved through no cost and resulting in all of the cards ending up back where they started. And if the architecture of the deck includes Monster Reborn, the Dark Magicians, DDR Polymerization, or Tuners, this framework can achieve nearly anything possible in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! For those of you that want more information about this combo and how it's achieved, I'm uploading a separate step-by-step -step tutorial with all the deets, as it'll take too long to include in this video. Getting these 10 constituent components in their right places is no small feat, as it basically necessitates the drawing of your entire deck. Now there are plenty of videos here on YouTube which can show you how to draw your entire deck in just one turn. However, what these videos often don't show you is how consistently they achieve this. You'll see a replay of them starting with their perfect hand or their favorite one card opener. That's good and all, but games of Yu-Gi-Oh don't start with the perfect card. They start with a random selection of five. And you might think, well, that's better, there's more cards. But often, the combos they use inherently rely on retrieving cards specifically from the deck. And this is great until you draw them in your starting hand. There's a difference between a deck which is capable and one which is consistently capable. And it is within this gap that I thought there was room to pitch a deck core judged on its capability of achieving sandbox mode as consistently as possible in its opening turn. Now for any normal deck, you could simply playtest it against your friends to see which cards work and which don't. But sandbox mode takes an awfully long time to play. In this clip, from 2021, I use sandbox mode to summon Zushin, the sleeping giant, and Sophia, goddess of rebirth, on my first turn. Sophia hits the board 92 minutes into my first turn. Who in their right mind is going to sit through that? And you might think, oh, it's going to be quicker in real life, but people scoop once they see you drawing their deck. They're used to turns which are lasting 15, 20 minutes and result in a board that they just can't beat. They don't know you're going for some meme strategy. So if you can't playtest this deck online or against real people, how can you ever make it as good as it can be? Well, my solution was to code a brand new 
Digital Jewel Simulator. And so over the past year, my spare time has been spent trying to bring this to life. Decks have been compiled and jewels have been simulated. In each simulation, I went first and saw whether I could achieve sandbox mode in one turn based upon that starting hand. How many jewels did I simulate? Well, sometimes you get an idea after, say, 50. But for a proper analysis, I'd like to simulate 10,000 joules. And with a bit of parallel processing, I could test hundreds of decks at the same time. Just in the first half of December, I've performed over 12 million jewel simulations against opponents of varying difficulty. When I told my friends what I've been doing for all these hours, they pretty much say the same thing. This wouldn't make good YouTube content. And they're right, it wouldn't. But I didn't really plan to go over the minutiae of this code. My plan was to use this code as the backbone of a simple website. A visitor could select the cards they wanted to use in sandbox mode, and based on my simulations, it would craft them a solid deck based upon the difficulty of the opponent they'd expect to face. It could be the backbone of a portfolio of decks which conquer the most intricate and contrived of card playing requirements. And the question that you, dear viewer, might be asking yourself Where is this website? Well, it's hit a snag in its creation, as you'll see in this reenactment of true events. Ah, the final member is here. Please, sit right down at the front. I hope there's a good explanation for your lateness. <clears throat> Presenting Exodia Necros through sandbox mode. Oh goody, a deck nobody can actually use. You've optimized the fun out of being a casual. This is a YouTube channel. We can't simply make the same content over and over. But the numbers speak for themselves. I didn't want it to come to this, but... Would you like to see my mask? Um, probably not very frightening to a guy like you, but these crazies, they can't stand it. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. I don't know what sounds. What an awful dream. Yeah, so Isolde got banned. And whilst this card isn't part of the core 10 that you need to enact sandbox mode, it is the critical card that lets you get to those core 10 pieces. Once you take out Isolde, the whole thing falls apart, and there isn't an equivalent replacement. Yet. And this time to explore the thousands of cards in Yu-Gi-Oh, searching for those hidden gems that'll one day replicate what we've had. That's exciting. This is one of the game's great strengths. And so someday, I might be back with a sequel to this video. And someday the sandbox deck generator might make it live before the combo gets banned. But today is not this day. Today is the day to achieve the ultimate alternative win condition. Stealing your opponent's deck. Now for good reason, this game doesn't readily allow you to exchange cards with your opponent. The only two cards in the game that can go into the opponent's deck are Parasite Parasite and Pharaoh's Treasure. So that one's a bit more complicated because you have to give it to your opponent first and then force its activation. My way of stealing my opponent's deck is to give them my deck in return in the form of Gift Exchange. Through Sandbox mode, you can activate one copy of Gift Exchange over and over again, and then end your turn with an explosion of cards being thrown to the other side of the table. 
you can add a bit of spice by giving your opponent Exodia and letting them win the game, or you could simply declare yourself the winner and run away.